So the next step in this project is to make the panels that are going to go on the top and bottom of each one of these tiers. So we've got 12 panels to make, you know, in my case, because I'm making two of these units. The reason I want to do the panels next is because what? the panels are going to size the amount of room that's left between the panels. And based on that, I'll be able to determine the size I can make the drawer webbing that we're going to put inside. So now the panels are going to have a maple burl veneer on the top, and we're going to do a book and end match of that. I picked this burl up from Joe Woodworker's site, which is veneersupplies.com, and it's a really nice looking burl. Uh, there's a bit of a packaging here over top of it, so you're probably going to have a bit of a time seeing it. But it's got a great looking grain down here, and it's a little bit more plain up here. I mean, not so much plain as it is that here it's dark and here it's light. So because of that, we're going to be able to do some really nice effect doing the book and end match. Now the panels are going to be rabbited in into the top and the bottom, as well as attached to the drawer webbing that's going to be on the inside. So they're going to be very, very well supported uh, for any of the weight that's on the top and of course helping to keep the panel flat. But you got to remember that all of this is on an angle. So yes, even rabbiting that edge, that's a more complicated operation. But we'll show you how to make this really, really easy. So now the second veneer I have is on the bottom panels. The bottom panels are going to be just curly maple. So I got some curly maple from Certainly Wood. I also picked up some poplar from Certainly Wood so I could use that as a backing veneer since all these panels are going to need a backing veneer on the underside of the top and on the top of the bottom. So it's always going to be on the inside of the cabinet. Now, if you're not familiar with MDO, basically it's plywood that instead of having a nice veneered surface like you're used to, it has MDF. So you have this little thin layer of MDF on the top and then the rest of it is regular plywood core. So what's nice about this is that strength-wise, this is far stronger than the same thickness of MDF. Other benefit, it's half the weight of the equivalent size of MDF. Now the only problem is, there's only one place in Arizona that sells this stuff. They don't normally carry two-sided MDO, so I unfortunately have one-sided MDO. And this is C-grade ply on the bottom, so this is pretty this is pretty butt ugly. Fortunately, this is going to be on the inside and it's going to be covered by the poplar veneer. But we still don't want this thing to be, you know, this rough. There's a lot of ridges in here and there's a lot of voids. It's C grade. That's what you get for C grade. So basically what we really need is we really need to turn the C grade into B grade. And the way that you do that, you mix up some body filler, slather that on, you know, kind of scrape it over all the, all the bumps, let it set overnight, then hit it with a sander. And this is the result. This is actually one of the panels that will be getting veneered and it's already been hit with the body filler. And you, know, you can see there's a different discolorations, but these are all the same discolorations that you're going to see in B-grade ply. So the panels are going to be done with vacuum bagging. We're going to vacuum bag 12 of them because I'm building two of these units. So we're going to start by doing the bottom panels because they take just some simple curly maple and some poplar. So there's no fancy book end matching. I'm going to be doing some flattening of the veneer. We're going to go through all of that in this episode. So this is probably going to be a nice long episode, but it's going to be a fun one. So let's get going. So to do all these panels in the vacuum bag, I need to have a platen at the bottom. Now, uh, my vacuum system, I've had it for uh, about six months now, and I use it mostly for vacuum clamping. I've used the bag actually at other people's places for some vacuum pressing, but uh, never here. So I need to make my platen. Basically, all it's going to be is a piece of melamine that has V-grooves cut in a grid pattern. The idea is to give a place for the air to get evacuated out to the sides. So that's what I'm going to do with the MFK 700, run some V-grooves in a grid pattern, and then I'm going to round all these edges, including these corners especially. I don't want this bag to get sucked down and pressed against a sharp corner. So let's go ahead and run it. So the platen's all ready to go, got all the grooves in, I rounded all the corners, softened them up, and then made a hole here for sort of a vampire tap that connects up to uh, a nipple that's on the outside of this bag, so you can basically you connect the vacuum hose straight up through it to get onto the inside. And you'll see all that when we go through the process. So our next step is to flatten the veneer before we go to apply it onto the board. Sometimes the veneer is flat enough that you can just use it straight away. Other times you need to do a flattening process beforehand, otherwise it'll get kind of crushed and mangled and not really work well when you're doing the pressing. Now in this roll I have a number of different veneers that came from there. They're all looking extremely flat. Now this veneer is really nice. 
I've got, here's the curly maple that we're going to be using on the underside of the top panels. I did order a sheet of Wenge because I've got a couple other projects in mind and I want that for the contrast. And also they had some really nice satin wood on there and that's what this yellow sheet is that you can see here. So these are some really nice pieces of them. These are pretty much flat, ready to go. Now the maple burl on the other hand is really lumpy. You can just see all the lumps through there. So let me take it out of the packaging so you can see it a little bit better. Now these are normally sequenced at the factory. So this one here is numbered one, so they considered it the first one, but they didn't number the other sheets. So I'm going to go ahead and number those in a moment with some chalk. But mostly what we're going to plan on doing here is I'm using, I'm using my second plate and board upside down so I have a nice flat surface. And then that's the other offcut of the melamine that I had for making this plate. So what we're going to do is we're going to be spraying it with some veneer softener. And that just basically you know, takes the bite out of the veneer a little bit, softens it up, and then we're going to be pressing it between papers so that you know, there's somewhere for the extra moisture to go besides just holding it in a really nice humid environment until it gets a chance to press itself down. And then we do an exchange of papers about three times before it's totally dry. So let me get some chalk and I'm going to label the rest of these sheets. There we go. So now we can reorient these. Now normally when you pay attention to the orientation is mostly when you're trying to do like a radial match where you're panning these out almost like you're dealing a deck of cards or fanning out a deck of cards because this sheet here being one and the next one being two these are the most similar to each other then two is similar to three but one is not quite as close to being the same as three as say two so if you were doing a radial match you want to really pay attention to this because there's different ways to distribute the sheets so that you can maximize uh, the sort of uh, the similarity of the pieces that are next to each other. Now in my case I'm not going to be doing a radial match on this project. What I'm going to be doing is a book and end match. Now most people are familiar with the book match. So it's very much I take these two sheets, these two sheets that appear sequentially in the packet and it's as if I just open it up. So I'll open it up like this and now we've got our book match. So this side here is a mirror image of the other one. So for a book and end match which is another possibility that we're going to have you would take this other sheet, do the same thing, and then you would take this and then you would flip it over. So now you've got the book and end match, kind of brings all the same similar things into the middle, and as you go out then they become mirror images of each other that way. And we're going to see this more once I flatten this out and I'll show a couple different variations that we can possibly use and try deciding which one we like. And of course there's different orientations even of this book and end match. We could flip it different directions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a sheet of newspaper down here. I'm going to spritz one of these on both sides to get some good veneer softener on both sides and then I'm going to place it down. Then we're going to put a piece of sheet and then another piece of veneer and just march our way through. pressed against my assembly table now for about a week. I was waiting for an installation of my uh, shop air conditioner, so it's so much nicer in here now, you have no idea. <laughs> but uh, normally it doesn't take this many days, you just leave it a couple days until it gets nice and dry. So this top piece of melamine was the offcut I had when I made the plate and just apply some nice even pressure. Here's some thick cloth that I'm using. This is something I picked up from Paul Church. What he likes to do is when he presses down, when you're doing the actual vacuum pressing, you want to use this to be able to handle different thicknesses of the veneer. So this will kind of make up for the different thicknesses as it's being pressed down, especially when you're dealing with marquetry where there are different veneers. But it seems to make good sense here as well since these all started out kind of lumpy. So now in here, if you saw what the burls looked like before, you can see that they're nice and flat now. But when we go to do the jointing and the tape up and everything, we're going to be able to get nice clean joints. But I'm still going to want to keep these flat, so I'm going to keep them in the packet. 
take a couple boards, put them on either side, and just sort of clamp it up and set it aside so we can use the table for doing the jointing of the curly maple. Just like that. So while the curly maple veneer was pretty flat and we can go straight to using it, the problem is it's not wide enough and we have two live edges basically on either side of this veneer sheet and you know it's, it uh, tapers down actually significantly on this end here. So we have to kind of cherry pick where we're going to cut parts of this veneer out in order to make all the panels. Now this is the substrate for the middle tier of the cabinet. And you can see actually that this veneer isn't even wide enough to be able to cover it. Now this is cut oversized because what I want is I want the veneer to go out to close to the edges but not actually go over the edges and then be able to trim to the actual size I need. Now as a small tangent, the reason why I don't want the veneer to actually go over the edge of the substrate is, you know, here's a small piece that I resaw it off of Poplar. If we looked at it on this edge, you know, you can see I could glue this down, it's going to be flat. As soon as I get this piece of veneer over on the edge, and then you picture the vacuum bag coming down and pressing on it, you can see that it's rounding. So it's going to round up over here. I mean, granted, the vacuum is going to be fighting that as well, but overall it might cause some problems, and it's, it's known to cause problems. So you don't want to have the veneer go over the edge too much, or at least you want to make sure that you have a backer that's going to cover that. But then backers have problems when they go over edges too, because the vacuum tends to want to break them. So what I need to do is I need to cut two pieces of this length of the veneer. So I have, have it marked here. I have it marked with some red crayon that you're going to have a hard time seeing probably on either of the cameras. But there's a mark here and a mark there. That's for the middle tier. So I'll be cutting two pieces of veneer for that. And then we're going to joint it to create the piece that we're going to glue onto the panel. Because these pieces are generally going to be about 10 and a half inches wide after I do the full jointing, I'm going to need two side by side on each and then we'll throw away some parts. So what I want to do first is I'm going to take a veneer saw, and this is just a, a common everyday veneer saw. Uh, here, here's an interesting thing that I learned in uh, the Paul Church seminar is, you know, it, it makes perfect sense after someone says it. These things are horrible until you sharpen them, just like a chisel. So you do need to start sharpen these teeth, and then once you do that, it actually cuts very, very well. I'm going to go ahead and cut through all four pieces of veneer since these are all very much the same size. This is mostly so I don't mangle my uh, lovely bench. And now for this I'm going to use, this is a guide that uh, I got from Paul Church. He sells these online actually from his school. It's a, a brass rod. On one side it's got a beveled edge on it, and the other one it's straight along with this plywood that's got a handle. It works out really well that you can you know, put this on the line that you want it. I mean, this we don't have to be super accurate on this because it's oversized. But if you needed to be super accurate in the case of like marquetry, What's nice is you can get that right on there, and then this saw blade here is going to run exactly on the edge. You can push it up against the side, and you're going to get a nice 90 degree cut. So it's a really accurate way of doing it. So let me go ahead and cut these pieces here. So one of the things that he pointed out is that when you're doing it, press the uh, saw up against the side of this edge. And what you're going to try doing is you're not going to want to keep it just straight and cut, or else you're only cutting with this middle part. You're going to want to kind of roll it. So it's just a gentle roll but it'll actually make for a very nice cut. Go a couple light passes at first to score it. Now if you were to take a look at this edge, and I'll bring that up a little bit closer. So take a look at this edge. You can see how clean that is. Now this is with all four slices one on top of each other, but even as I peel these apart and you get to look at that, I mean that saw makes a really good cut even though it was a cross cut. Now the edges here are a little bit ratty just because of the way it's almost a live edge on the edge of this veneer, so there there was a little bit of a breakout. If for some reason you need to worry about that, put a piece of blue tape there first and that will help hold it in place as you go and do the cut. And honestly you can kind of chisel that part off first to uh, basically pre-score. So this is going to become the bottom tier, the middle tier, and then the top tier. But we need to get the edges straight on this. So far I've been using the veneer saw for doing all of my edges that are going to be jointed together for a nice clean cut. That works really well so far, but what I'd like to do is it's kind of on the slow side. And I would like to have some way of doing possibly batching them together and getting a lot more done at the same time. So what I'd like to do is basically make a small fence to be able to use the MFK 700 or any router that you're going to run on here with a flush trimming bit that we're going to flush the edge. So the idea would be if I take this 
scrap piece of veneer, if I were to put it in here on this board, and then I close this on the top so that part of it's sticking out, then now I'm just going to run the flush trimming bit over top of it and get a clean edge. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to build a quick jig for doing that. Now these are the two pieces of MDF that I've been using so far for cutting. So this one's all kind of sliced up on, on the surface here. So what I want is I want this to be zero clearance. I want the bottom and the top to be perfectly aligned whenever I go to use this jig. And then I can do the flushing using a down spiral bit that I've got chucked up in the MFK 700 so that it's going to be pressing it down using the bottom as a, as a backer to be able to get a nice clean cut. So I am going to be straightening these out after we get the jig together. So the beauty of this jig idea is that it's really simple to put together if you've got a domino lying around. So I'll just kind of square these up so that they're at least lengthwise correct. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to plow two dominoes on this side and then two dominoes on this side and we're just going to stick the domino straight in. They're going to be used strictly for kind of locking the two pieces in place. Once that's done, run around the table saw to get some clean edges on here. And then after that, each time you put a piece of veneer in, you just use the dominoes to realign it and get it perfectly aligned. Now I'm going to take it to the table saw, get some straight edges, and we'll see how this works. So it's ready to go. Cleaned up both sides so we got it nice and straight. Uh, the more I looked at it afterwards, I realized that this is almost loosely based on the idea of the Quaz Rail Dogs. So if this doesn't work, I'm blaming Steve. Just pull that up a little bit. I have my piece of veneer that I want to try, just a piece of scrap. I haven't even cut the edge in the least. So if I wanted to joint it, it might be there. There we go. Give it a try. Okay, now I'm feeling stupid for not having done that a little bit earlier. So that's a really clean cut. Now we're going to have to try this on the burl kind of separately, although the burl's been flattened, so it's been softened with the veneer softener and such, so uh, it's a little bit toughened up on the edges. And we can always use some veneer tape on an edge. Put a little bit of the paper veneer tape on there, then put this down, it'll greatly strengthen it to make a clean cut. So So I have all the curly maple jointed here. All the edges have been cut cleanly. This was all done with a veneer saw. I did not use the router for this one here. I'll be using that for the burl and then some of the poplar for some trimming later. But what I want to do now is I want to get the curly maple joined so that these are the, the widths I need for the panels. And that way there I can at least get all the bottom panels of each of the three tiers into the vacuum bag uh, and get those going over this weekend while I work on the burls. So now for doing this process, we're just going to take this and we're going to book match it open. So we're going to flip it open like a book. can do a little bit of aligning because even though these came sequentially off of a, of a log, there's still, you know, the grain is moving through that log. So even though I should be able to put these things square on the bottom here and have it line up perfectly, sometimes you'll find that when there's a line of grain that goes and carries over, sometimes you can do a better job by scooting it around. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider this to be the top part, the show face. So I need to be able to tape this with some veneer tape so that when it gets pressed, the tape is holding the joint together while it's being pressed. So the way I'm going to do this is if I'm treating this as my show face, I'm going to take just a little bit of blue tape to help me align this. Now I'm going to flip it over to what would be the glue side. So now with this being the glue side, what I want to do is I want to pull the seam together really tightly so that when I put the veneer tape on, I'm not trying to struggle to put the veneer tape on and push the joint together to leave it tight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some blue tape and basically go across the joint to snug this thing up. Now you want to make sure you never get the veneer to be on top of itself. So you need it to be just jointed up on the edge. So if we put this on there, you're going to put it on the one side, pull it across to get it nice and tight. And you can get a very good joint this way. You'll find doing veneering is a lot of taping. <laughs> so while this little uh, dispenser over here seems like it's a luxury, it is so useful to have when you're doing this. There we go. So now we can flip this over, and on this side here, we've got a nice clean joint. So you can peel this off. 
Now what I'm going to put on next is gum tape. There's a lot of little veneer tapes. This one here actually is backed with hide glue. So uh, you're not going to want to lick it. <laughs> so it has a water dispenser here in order to wet the tape as you're pulling it off. And the advantage of the hide glue is that after we're done with the pressing, we can just use a little bit of warm water and we can pretty much scrape it right off. And the hide glue, any residue, really isn't going to affect the finish at all. The other advantage is that hide glue, as it sets and dries, is it shrinks. So when we put it on here, and this has already been pulled tight, once we put that glue on there and then we set something over top of it while it dries, it's just going to snug that joint up really nice and tight for us. Now there are some other tapes that you can use. This is the regular veneer tape that you've seen me use often, and I use it for labeling things. Everything that's in this project has been labeled with this tape, and you can certainly use this tape as well. You don't need to use the gum tape. This one here would also release with water. There are some tapes, though, that don't require any water. Like this is one, I believe I got it from veneersupplies.com, and it's a, they call it quick stitch veneer tape because it's waterless, so you can just peel this off and you can pop it on. So basically, it's like a low-tack tape that's safe to put under the vacuum bag, and won't really stick too hard or leave any problems for the finish. So it's kind of like the blue tape of veneer tape. Okay, so for putting this down, we're just going to stretch it right along this gap. So now for applying this, we're just going to pull this tape. It sticks like crazy. Push that on there. We're going to burnish it down with a brass brush. You'll see it become translucent as it sticks better. There we go, that's basically it. Not real hard, it takes longer for me to explain it just because I talk too much. Now since this is water-based and we just ended up putting some water on the edge of this, it's usually good to uh, put, some, put a little bit of weight on it while it's drying, just so that it doesn't want to curl or anything like that. For a piece like this, not really a big deal, but if you're doing anything like some marquetry, those little tiny pieces that you cut, they're going to want to go all over the place. So earlier today I set up the vacuum pump and the platen uh, with the bag and everything on here and then I I threw in a couple of shop towels into the bag and smashed it down with the vacuum and then just sort of let it sit there for a while to make sure that the vacuum wasn't going to cycle, which would indicate a leak of some kind, whether it's a bag puncture or something wrong with the chip clip that we use for sealing the bag, which you'll see a little bit later. And everything worked just fine, so things should go pretty well. That's always an optimistic way to start a glue up. Say it's going to go pretty well. So I have a glue up station over here. And that's actually why you're a little bit far away, is during the glue-up, I'm not really going to have time to move the camera. So I thought, well, I'll just put your way back there, you can see both. <clears throat> so for the close-ups, use your imagination. Now for doing the glue-up, I'm going to be using a plastic resin glue. I'm using Better Bond uh, Ultra Cat glue. Uh, this is perfect for doing veneering. So working with it is really easy. Just measure out some of the powder and mix in the water. Uh, you go through a little bit of a blending. In a way, if you do cooking at all, you know how you deal with gelatins, you tend to do a blending and then you let it sit for a bit so that actually the water can get absorbed more into it. That's very much how this pre-cat better bond glue works. Now because it's a urea formaldehyde glue, you're going to want to use a mask with this because it does emit a formaldehyde as it gets as soon as it starts to get mixed. And also because it's powder and you know like I've got the AC now blowing. I love saying that, the AC you know, it can get a little bit of the fine dust in the air. Well, guess what? It mixes with water like the stuff that's in your nose and that can be not very good. So you want to have a mask when you're doing anything with this. Now it turns out that this glue, when you mix it up, is going to tend to be more of a brownish glue. So it's going to look, it's going to look a little like a light walnut. Now the problem is I'm using a curly maple. So if there's any voids in here or any glue squeeze through that comes through the veneer, it's going to look like crap. Now to lighten up the color of the glue, what we're going to use is Ultra Cat Lightener. Basically it's kind of like a white pigment, so it's like I'm assuming it's a titanium pigment. And it's inert, you're going to be mixing it with a little bit of water. Once it's blended, you're going to add a little bit of it, very, very little of it, because it goes a long way, uh, to the glue in order to lighten that up so that we can get it to be just a tone less than the curly maple. I don't really want any of the bleed through to be visible. So next let's talk about this sandwich that I'm talking about making. This is the board that we're going to be applying the veneer to. I've currently got what would be the underside. This is going to be the poplar side that's going to go to the inside of the cabinet. I've got that face up because we're going to apply the poplar veneer first on this. Then we're going to flip it over and then we're going to apply the curly maple on the nice smooth side. Now underneath it I've got a backer board. What it is is just another one of these panels. So I've got the smooth side up. This backer is necessary because if we just put the veneer straight on this and put it on that plate and because of the V grooves, 
we're not going to get any pressure onto the veneer at those places. So you'd be able to pull this thing out and you'd clearly see this waffle effect of having that grid pattern on there. So this provides a smooth surface for the press. Now I've got a sheet of, of plastic here. This is just some underlayment plastic that you can get. You can get it really cheap, but you have to buy this huge box. But it's super useful for this because when I do the veneering on here, of course, there's going to be some squeeze out of the glue. This way here, I'm not going to be gluing it down to my backer at all. So the idea is, once I've got the veneer on both sides, I'm going to flip the this clean over the top, and then we're going to put another backer board on the top. So I have this extra board that I routed some rounded edges on so that we don't pop holes through the bags. So I've got the smooth side down to where the veneer is going to go, and then ultimately we're going to end up putting this cloth that I mentioned earlier in the episode over the top of the whole thing. And you're going to see a close-up of this when it's in the bag, and you'll see how well this works for avoiding some of the sharp corners on the edge. So some of these corners that are on the edge, this bag is going to conform around it, and it's going to keep from puncturing the bag, but at the same time as it's applying a full pressure on it. So I'm kind of setting all this up ahead of time, because once I put the mask on and doing the work, the best I'm going to be able to do is give you some subtitles along the way. So one of the last things to check before you start doing the glue-up is that on these nice panels that you put together, you're, you're going to be putting the veneer tape up because that's going to be peeled away later when we get it all nice and wet. But the thing is, you want to make sure you don't have any glue tape on the bottom. That would not be good. Now one other thing I did is on both sides of this panel, I went ahead and I sanded it just lightly with some 180 grit sandpaper just mostly to make sure that any of the junk that might have got on here these panels have been put on my floor over here and moved around and had weights sitting on them and things like that. I want to make sure that any of that has been removed. We got the panel under a vacuum. The vacuum pump shows that we're at negative 22 inches of mercury, so that works out to approximately 1,550 pounds per square foot. Now you can see how this canvas that I put on here, because of the way that it tends to soften the corners. Now the topmost backer that I put on here did have rounded edges on it, but of course the boards on the bottom still had squared edges. So it's nice that this way here the bag can't come in underneath the backer and press up against that sharp edge just makes it a whole lot easier and it's not really that difficult to do to just toss that on there. So it's, uh, it really works out well. And that was definitely an excellent tip I picked up from Paul Church for using it on marquetry, but in this case here I'm using it for about everything else as well. Now this chip clip just closes the end of the bag. So I'm going to leave this overnight. That's way longer than it needs to to cure, but I don't mind leaving it in there longer. But one thing to consider is that in a way this looks like, well, that's terrible. It's going to take like, you know, overnight for a single panel. Then you do some in the morning, maybe in the late afternoon, you can take it out and you get another one. So it seems like it's a really slow process. One thing that I'm going to do off camera to get through the rest of these panels is I can leave this here. The nominal cure, worst case cure, is going to be six hours at 70 degrees. It's warmer than that in this shop. So it's easily going to be cured by that six hours. So what I plan on doing is I'm going to prepare the next panel that needs to go in on the side. I still would like this to actually be in overnight. So what I'll do is at the end of the six hours, uh, 
I'll open this bag up just before I go to get that other panel ready and I can slide it in on top of this one here, put the cloth over the top of it, then bring down the vacuum. It'll press both boards down. So uh, you can actually stack these up. So especially since this is the bottom of the topmost tier, when I go to do the middle tier, I can do both of its panels simultaneously along with the two from the bottom one. And I'll be able to just sneak those in as I get a chance to. So I've run a couple of the curly maple poplar panels through the bag already, and now I wanna, I wanna include this part of the burls on this video. So I just put a board on top of the bag so we can do a little bit of the visuals of how to do this four-way book match. Now, it's called the four-way book match, also called the book and end match. That's the thing where we open it up as a book in two places and then flip it over to get the fourth. So I've got two of the sheets of burl here, and these are sequential. This one's 13 and this one's 14. Now, because of all the delays that I've had in my shop with other things and such, since these things got flattened, you can see that they've gotten themselves a little bit curvy again. Uh, they're not too bad. You can press them down. They don't make too many crunchy noises and they don't crack, so I think we're still okay. But I could always hit them with just a light little bit of veneer softener later if I absolutely needed to. Now, right now, this is looking like a slip match. It's just with number 13 on the top and then 14 below. A slip match is just where you slide it out. So you can see it's nothing terribly special. With a burl, it really looks good when you end up doing a book match. So the book match version of this would be that you take this and you fold that out like a book. So that's one half of it. Now, if we had another two sheets book match like this, we would flip it this way for the book and end. But right now, I want to make some decisions on whether we're going to book match it this way or possibly book match it this way instead. Now, you have to remember that this is going to have some components for a stereo on it on each of the different shelves. So if we did it the more normal way, well, normal, I guess, more traditional way, we do the book and end match, this cloud of burl down here would end up being in the middle. So let me get the other four sheets. So if I push these a little bit further, and I can show you the other two sheets that we've got here, this would be the book and end match of this burl. So you can see that this is a book match here, and there's an equal book match on the other side, and these themselves are mirror imaged. But the thing is, is we're going to take this large sheet that we end up with, and we're going to cut it to fit one of the panels. And the panels are significantly smaller, so there's a lot that's going to get removed. So if we kept this cloud here in the middle, so we'll pretend that the edge of the panel comes up to here. Well, you can see that if you put a stereo component on it, you're going to com almost completely cover up all the really nice part. And then sort of the, the, the less burly, less rolling uh, cloud look of the burl is going to be the only part that's exposed. So it kind of ruins the effect, given the utility of this cabinet, what we're going to be using it for. So a different option would be, instead of book matching it this way, is that we put the really cloudy part of the burl towards the outside. So you could imagine that I get both of these book matches individually, separately, book matched and veneer taped together so that the cloudy part of the burl is on the outside. I take the two veneer book matches that I'm going to use together for the book and end match, and then I size them correctly for the level that I'm on so that this cloud of burl is on the outside edge of that shelf, and then that outside edge of the shelf. And then we just make it so that it's mirror imaged in the middle. We shorten this up so that it becomes mirror imaged. So the nice part about that is that if you put the stereo component here in the middle, you're going to have this really rolling, cloudy, nice uh, burl out on the outside edge. So that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to put the burl towards the outside edge of each of these shelves. So I'll be taping this up, you know, jointing and veneer taping this up separately from that. Keep the two together, and then when I go to do a particular shelf, I'll do the cuts and joining it together to keep this to the outside edge. So then comes the decision, well, do we put it this way, or do we put it this way? Well, to me, this way here, okay, this burl cloud that we have on the edge, it's still a burl cloud. There's really no, no significant difference in the look of that. If I put it this way here, I get sort of some cloudy effect out here, cloudy effect out here, and plain in the middle. We're going to be covering that up, so that may not be all that bad. If, on the other hand, I go and I put it this way, well, I get some nice, real good mirror imaging here in the middle. I'm hoping that you're going to be able to see that on the upper camera. So I think that this is the way I'm going to want to do the book and end match. This is the way it's going to be towards the center. What I like about this option here is that if I go from being a stereo center to being just a cabinet, then at least it's got a lot of the book matching that we care about. So you're going to see this nice cloud on the outside edges, and then towards the inside, you really see the book and end match. 
So this is the way that I'm going to go for it. Now, if we're doing the jointing, and I've already done this on these two sheets, I'm going to want to put some veneer tape on the edges. These edges got have a lot of little chips that come off, like here was a piece of a nut that actually already came off. Uh, that's fine. When I go and do the glue up, I'll just drop it into the hole. The glue will fill the outside. It'll look just fine. Even if it's just the glue, it'll look just fine. So what I did is I just put a little bit of the veneer tape, the gum tape, on the edge here. Uh, it's not perfectly to the edge. That doesn't really matter because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my jig with the router in order to straight line this up. So I'm going to do that off camera for the rest of this episode. You know, I just wanted to be able to show you what decisions I've got going on this burl. And then in the next episode, I'll go through and show you some of the panels. One of the panels had a couple little spots where the glue didn't seem to take quite right. So I'll show you how to patch that up. It's uh, not the end of the world. It's disappointing, but it's not the end of the world. It'll probably happen more than a few times in this whole project. So uh, I'll leave it at that. These are going to go in, and we're going to get a photo update in a couple days. Thanks.